God bless you all. My name is David Ewan, and I head up the Bravehearted Men's Ministry at the Resurrection Center. Last year, I told you the detailed story of the Mayflower. This year, I share how God is in the mix. Today's agenda is the journey with God in the center, the Mayflower Compact. We'll talk about that. Number three, the U.S. Presidents and Thanksgiving. And number four, what God says about Thanksgiving. Number five, biblical truths about Thanksgiving. Number six, Thanksgiving understood in the Bible. Number seven, what U.S. citizens are thankful for. And number eight, being thankful during this historic pandemic. And number nine, what the Resurrection Center is thankful for. The famous Mayflower story began in 1606, when a group of reform-minded Puritans in Nottingham, England, I should say Nottinghamshire, England, founded their own church separate from the state-sanctioned Church of England. Accused of treason, they were forced to leave the country and settle in the more tolerant Netherlands. After 12 years of struggling to adapt and make a decent living, the group sought financial backing from the London merchants to set up a colony in the New World. And the New World is across the Atlantic from where they were. The pilgrims were separatist Protestants who made a clean break with the Church of England during the reign of King James. They believed in strict adherence to the word of Jesus Christ. Led by their pastor, John Robinson, they first moved in 1609 to Leyden, Holland, but after 11 years, they wanted a place of their own. Their children were losing their identity in this new place. They moved back to England to prepare for the move to the, in, to the new world across the Atlantic. So on September 6th in the year 1620, 102 passengers crowded on the Mayflower to begin the long, hard journey to a new life in the new world across the Atlantic. The Mayflower was one of two ships, but the other one had a leak and returned. Passengers on both ships were now on just the Mayflower, crowded. On November 9th, 1620, the Mayflower, carrying 102 passengers with 50 pilgrims on board in search of religious freedom, approached Cape Cod, Massachusetts, having left England 65 days earlier on September 6th, 1620. On November 11th, 1620, the Mayflower anchored. That was 400 years ago. A week ago was the anniversary that this uh, was also a Wednesday. The ship was lost through a storm. It was going in the wrong direction. It was originally headed to Jamestown to join an existing settlement in a new colony. Uh, instead, they arrived in a barren land, a totally void of crops. There was no way of surviving there. They were called pilgrims by their journalist, William Bradford, who had in mind the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 13 through 16, when he wrote, they knew, there were, they knew they were pilgrims and looked not much on those things, but lifted up their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. They wished to live in a community life as the apostles in the New Testament of the Bible. After exploring the region, the settlers chose a cleared area previously occupied by the members of a local native tribe, the Wampanoag. The tribe had abandoned the village several years earlier after an outbreak of European disease. The winter of 1620 through 1621 was brutal as the pilgrims struggled to build their settlement, find food, and ward off sickness by spring 50. Nearly half of the original 102 Mayflower passengers were dead. The remaining settlers made contact with returning members of the Wampanoag tribe, and in March, they signed a peace treaty with a tribal chief, Massasoit. Now you know where the name Massachusetts comes from. Aided by the Wampanoag, especially the English-speaking Squanto and the pilgrims, were able to plant crops, especially corn and beans, that were vital for their survival. The Mayflower and its crew left the uh, Ply Plymouth to return to England on April 5th, 1621. So they were there for the winter. So this is what happened. Th let's talk about the 102 passengers. They were made up of 50 saints, that's the pilgrims, and strangers, the non-separatists, those that were for the Church of England. Um, in view of the independent spirit of some, it became evident of 
to both saints and the strangers uh, that they needed to cooperate and sign an agreement to rule themselves as they were going to settle in an area that was not within the purview of their patent, meaning they weren't going to Jamestown. The elder William Brewster, William Bradford, Edward Winslow, and the pilgrims, along with a soldier, Miles Standish, and the strangers, these are the non-pilgrims, agreed to sign a covenant before they landed to ensure representatives and self-government by which all of them would be bound. Signed by the 41 adult males on board on November 11, 1620, just nine years after the publication of the King James Bible, the Mayflower Compact was the first charter of freedom in America and reflects the Christian heritage of our nation. Now, let me read the Mayflower Compact, and you'll see how God was in the center. In the name of God, amen. That was the first sentence. In the name of God, amen. We, whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God, of England, France, and Ireland, King Defender of the Faith, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these present solemnly and mutually in the presence of God in one and of another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by the virtue to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the reign of our sovereign Lord, King James of England, France and Ireland, the 18th and of Scotland, the 54th. So that's the, uh, the compact. In keeping with the compact, the pilgrims confirmed John Carver, the first elected governor in the English colonies. The pilgrims landed at Provincetown, Cape Cod on November 11, 1620. The next day was Sunday. They stayed aboard the ship and worshiped God under the guidance of the elder Brewster. After crossing Cape Cod Bay, they found Plymouth Rock and decided this was the ideal spot to build a settlement. Because of stormy weather, it was not until December 23 that they were able to land and begin setting up home there they were on land on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day, and that was Plymouth Rock. Half of the colonists did not survive the first winter, including their first governor, John Carver. William Bradford was elected governor in the spring of 1621. The Pilgrims made a treaty with Massasoit, an alliance between the godly William Bradford and Massasoit, an alliance that would last as long as both were alive. That spring, the Indians... Samoset and Squanto showed the pilgrims how to cultivate land and plant corn and beans, squash and pumpkins and where to hunt and fish. The image of the first Thanksgiving at Plymouth in 1621 with the pilgrims and Massasoit and the Wampanoag Indians is forever etched upon the American conscience. This is what we think about when we think about Thanksgiving. The celebration lasted for three days. Here's how a settler Edward Winslow described their thankful hearts. And although it is not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, yet by the goodness of God, we are so far from want that we are often wish you partakers of our plenty. Over the next several decades, more and more settlers made the trek across the Atlantic to Plymouth, which gradually grew into a prosperous shipbuilding and fishing center. In 1691, Plymouth was incorporated into the new Massachusetts Bay Association, ending its history as an independent colony. Now I'm going to talk to you about the U.S. presidents and Thanksgiving and how they put God in the center. Here's George Washington. You see, Abraham Lincoln wasn't the first president to declare a national day of Thanksgiving for the people of the United States. In 1789, George Washington proclaimed a day of public thanksgiving and thanks to thank God for his protection as the source of all that is good. 
in his proclamation, he wrote, now therefore I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be, that we may all then unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country precious to their becoming a nation. That was George Washington. Now I'll talk about Abraham Lincoln. On October 3 in 1863, expressing gratitude for a pivotal Union Army victory at Gettysburg, President Abraham Lincoln announces that the nation will celebrate an official Thanksgiving holiday on November 26, 1863. On November 19, 1863, at the dedication of a military cemetery at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, during the American Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln delivered one of the most memorable speeches in American history. And that, of course, is the Gettysburg Address. Now let's talk about Franklin D. Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt observed Thanksgiving on the second to last Thursday of November for some time, but the amount of public outrage prompted Congress to pass a law on December 26, 1941, ensuring that all Americans would celebrate a unified Thanksgiving on the fourth Thursday of November every year. That's how it became the fourth Thursday of November of every year. The House agreed to the amendment and President Roosevelt signed the resolution on December 26, 1941, thus establishing the fourth Thursday in November as the federal Thanksgiving Day holiday. Now I'll talk to you about John F. Kennedy and how he put God in the center of Thanksgiving. So by President John F. Kennedy, presidential proclamation in November 4th, 1863, he was assassinated 18 days later on the 22nd. So I'm just gonna read excerpts. Over three centuries ago, our forefathers in Virginia and in Massachusetts, far from home in a lonely wilderness, set aside a time of Thanksgiving. On the appointed day, they gave reverent thanks for their safety, for the health of their children, for the fertility of their fields, for the love which bound them together, and for the faith which united them with their God. And so, too, in the midst of America's tragic civil war, President Lincoln proclaimed the last Thursday of November 1863 as a day to renew our gratitude for America's fruitful fields, for our national strength and vigor, and for all our uh, singular deliverances and blessings. You see, this was being said 100 years after the proclamation from Abraham Lincoln. And so it continues. Now, therefore, I, John F. Kennedy, President of the United States of America, in consonance with the joint resolution of Congress approved on December 26, 1941, 55 Statute 862, designating the fourth Thursday of November in each year as Thanksgiving Day, do hereby proclaim Thursday, November 28th, 1963, as a day of national Thanksgiving. So now I'm going to turn our attention to God. So what does God say about Thanksgiving? The concept of thanks comes up 102 times in the Old Testament, and this word is used 72 of those times. For example, uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, 16.34, the scripture says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. And again, that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 34. Uh, thanksgiving can strengthen your faith. Thanking and praising God gives a person immense strength that they could never dream of. By reminiscing about everything the Lord has done for you, your faith grows more and more each time you give thanks. I'll read in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything but in every situation. By prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. People who are thankful to God are thankful for those who care for them as well as God's blessings to them. Thankful people are content with how God has dealt with them. You see in Psalms 106, 107, 118, and 136, they all begin with these words. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. You see, Jesus taught us to be thankful 
and to be in fellowship. Science proves it. Research by U.S. psychologists indicate that gratitude can lead to better relationships. We should be thankful because it honors God. When we are thankful, we recognize that God exists and we are acting on the reality of his life and the very source and means of ours. True thankfulness recognizes our total dependence on God and stems from realizing that everything going on in our lives and all we have is the product of God's sovereign control, infinite wisdom, purposes, grace, and activity. And we see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. Now I will share with you three biblical truths about Thanksgiving. Three biblical truths about Thanksgiving. One, Thanksgiving relates to the Trinity. Two, Thanksgiving replaces sin. And number three, Thanksgiving in all circumstances. So the first one, Thanksgiving relates to the Trinity. The typical pattern of Thanksgiving in the New Testament is that God the Father is the object of Thanksgiving. God the Son is the person through whom Thanksgiving flows, and God the Holy Spirit is the source of Thanksgiving. The Apostle Paul models this in Romans chapter 1, verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. And in number two, thanksgiving replaces sin. When the Apostle Paul commands believers to stop sinning, he also commands believers to put thanksgiving in its place. The Apostle Paul writes, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor cruel joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. And that's in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4. And finally, number three, thanksgiving in all circumstances. One surprising aspect of thanksgiving is that it's for all circumstances, not just one big meal a year. The Apostle Paul writes, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And that's in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. So here are the three biblical truths about Thanksgiving. Number one was Thanksgiving as it relates to the Trinity. Number two, Thanksgiving replaces sin. And number three, Thanksgiving in all circumstances. Now we'll talk about how Thanksgiving is understood in the Bible. With promises of really great deals on Black Friday, littered between college football timeouts, the meaning of Thanksgiving sometimes gets missed. We pause to give thanks for the food, family members and friends gathered around the table in the midst of preparing elaborate meals and navigating family relations. But giving thanks, but giving thanks is in a practice reserved for a single day each year. It has a deeper spiritual significance and benefits that ring true after the leftovers are all consumed. In the times of uncertainty, just like we are in now, it may seem strange to turn to gratitude. But think about it, when else do we need to rely on God most except when we are faced with the unknown? You can be thankful even in the times of fear, sadness, and grief. Gratitude draws our eyes away from our pain, terror, and anxiety of loss and helps us focus on the gifts of this world, moving us forward along the healing process. There are also times when life just doesn't seem like a season for gratitude. Maybe you have a chronic illness. Maybe you're caring for an elderly parent or a special needs child. Thankfulness for these, excuse me, thankfulness for these circumstances, even when each day brings fresh challenges. Help us to find hope and meaning. We can be thankful that God guides us through these most challenging times. The Apostle Paul writes to the Church of Rome, not, and he says this, not only so, but we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And that's in Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 5. Gratitude collectively as a family or community, is a tremendous equalizer. When differences of political or religious or cultural opinion and stance are present, gratitude helps us focus on the areas of relationships that matter the most. It's hard to be grateful for each other and still wield our theological and political and cultural weapons. At the start of each of the letters from the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul sent throughout the first century following Jesus' uh, resurrection, 
the Apostle Paul expresses his thanks for the people. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. Paul writes it in Romans chapter 1, verse 8. I always thank my God for you because his grace has given you in Jesus Christ. He writes to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. I thank my God every time I remember you. He tells the church in Philippi in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. There's something about expressing your gratitude for a person, not just saying thank you when they do something, but saying thank you for just being. That forms a bond of trust in your relationship. It acknowledges a particular characteristic about a person that raises their esteem in the way the Apostle Paul says we ought to encourage one another or build one another up. Gratitude for another person may be one of the most impactful and practical ways we can build up one another. The traditions we enact with our friends and family are perhaps one of the most obvious forms of Thanksgiving. Traditional Traditions performed together spotlight the seasons of our lives in which we've seen God active and present in our lives. They hold the record of years past when the children were younger and we were all together and great grandpa was still alive and so on. They provide opportunities to reminisce. So let's talk about what United States citizens are thankful for. The first one is religious freedom, freedom for persecution. Number two, access to clean water, safe food, quality medicine. Number three, education for us and our children. Number four, safety from war on domestic lands. Number five, freedom of speech. Number six, the American dream, which is education, job, marriage, home. Uh, number seven, the beauty of America. See, it's not being bombed out. Number eight, culture. The blend is just right. Uh, number nine, the right to vote by mail, drive in, and at the polls. And number 10, a church family with God in the center and people who love you. Um, here's what we can be thankful for. Yes, during a pandemic. Number one, we can order restaurant food, groceries, and supplies. Uh, we're getting better at our cooking. Number two, jobs as gig workers. For example, Uber, Flex Delivery, Instacart. Um, number three, education continues. It's online. Uh, number four, streaming movies and music for entertainment along with the games. Number five, the Bible never left you. It's still there. Uh, this year, here's what the people of the Resurrection Center have to be thankful for. Number one, they had a birthday this year. Number two, they moved to a new home. Some of them moved to a new home. Number three, some got new cars. Some families got two new cars. Uh, number four, they got married, or perhaps they have a new love in their life. Number five, they have healthy babies and new ones on the way. Number six, uh, they have uh, saved their jobs and their businesses. Number seven, they went to college to broaden their horizons. Number eight, they have family who survived adversities. Number nine, they went on vacation or went on local travel. Number 10, they have clothes to wear and food to eat. Number 11, they have continued love from the resurrection set. Number 12, they know someone who prays for them. And number 13, most importantly, they aren't alone with friends, family, and the church family. You see, Thanksgiving is a time for food, friends, and family. It's also a time to pause, reflect on our lives, and think about what we are thankful for. Rejoice in the presence of the Lord for what he has given you. Do not focus on what you don't have, but to focus on what you do have. What uh, what will you be thankful for, for this Thanksgiving Day? Our agenda today was, number one, the journey with God the, in the center. Number two, the Mayflower Compact. Number three, the U.S. presidents and Thanksgiving. Number four, what God says about Thanksgiving. Number five, biblical truths uh, about Thanksgiving. Uh, and number six, Thanksgiving understood in the Bible. Number seven, what the U.S. citizens are thankful for. Uh, number eight, being thankful during his, this historic uh, pandemic. And number nine, what the Resurrection Center is thankful for. So again, what will you be thankful for this Thanksgiving Day? My name is David Ewan, and this is the Resurrection Center.